to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Good evening, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Austin in Focus on tonight's headlines. A Thai woman accused of a spate of poisoning has been charged with 14 counts of murder in one of the kingdom's worst suspected serial killing cases. The Philippine Coast Guard thanked the country's allies in expressing their support for the Philippine sovereignty at sea following run-ins with the China Coast Guard and militia vessels during a seven-day patrol at the West Philippine Sea. In its aim to help people around the world, the Iglesia de Cristo's Care for Humanity program conducted its blood donation activity in partnership with the Thai Red Cross. And the Iglesia de Cristo recently held a family sports day in Hanoi, Vietnam. Our ASEAN correspondent, Ria Ramos, reports from Hanoi. The United States reaffirmed its commitment to being the big brother of the country with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin Jr. saying his government will live up to the meaning of Balikatan or working shoulder to shoulder towards a further enhanced alliance. Mr. Austin gave the guarantee during his meeting with President Marcus at the Pentagon this morning where the American official said the U.S. will always be reminded of the enduring strength of the alliance and the shared commitment to advancing it further. Let's listen in. Uh call of the times, unfortunately, is uh, asking for us to meet these challenges, new challenges that perhaps we have not faced before. And that's why it is very important that these continuing exchanges that we have started, first uh, with the visits of uh, uh, the Vice President, uh, Secretary Blinken, yourself, uh, and the 2 plus 2 uh, meetings that we had conducted uh, last month. And so I look forward to discussing how we've uh, made the alliance stronger, including the recent expansion of our enhanced defense cooperation agreement to four new sites across the Philippines. I'd also like to talk about concluding our new bilateral defense guidelines and other ways that we can build on our progress. So, Mr. President, we're grateful for your enduring commitment to modernizing and, deep and deepening our alliance. Austin also echoed President Joe Biden's message that the U.S. commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad, as provided by the decades-old Mutual Defense Treaty. That's how you president. We're more than allies. We're family. And we share a common vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific because a region governed by rules and rights helps provide security and prosperity for our two countries and for the whole region. President Biden has made clear our commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. Once again, that our mutual defense treaty applies to armed attacks on our armed forces, Coast Guard vessels, public vessels, or aircraft in the Pacific, including anywhere in the South China Sea. So make no mistake, Mr. President, we will always have your back in the South China Sea or elsewhere in the region. In other news, a Thai woman accused of a spate of poisonings has been charged with 14 counts of murder, according to police today, in one of the kingdom's worst suspected serial killing cases. Sararat Rangsiwatapur is alleged to have swindled thousands of dollars out of her victims before poisoning them with cyanide. Take a look. She was arrested last week over nine suspicious deaths that took place over several years, but the police swiftly widened their probe. Her husband, a high-ranking policeman, is also facing fraud and embezzlement charges related to the murders, according to Deputy National Police Chief Surachate Hak. Surachate said Sararat lured 15 people, one of whom survived to take poisoned herb capsules. Last week, he also indicated the sums involved in each case ran into hundreds of thousands of baht, the equivalent of thousands of U.S. dollars. 
นะแต่แต่ขอไม่เอ่ยถึงจํานวนนะนะครับเมื่อไหร่ก็ตามที่มีการทวงเงินเมื่อนั้นก็จะเริ่มออกทํางานนะครับนะครับหาเหยื่อนะครับนะก็จะเป็นอย่างนี้นะครับการนี้คือแรงกระตุ้นเขานะครับ Both Sararat and her husband deny the allegations against them. Sararat, who's four months pregnant, is facing 14 charges of premeditated murder and one of attempted murder, but police are investigating up to three other potentially linked cases. ที่เป็นคนเอาเซยนายเนี่ยแล้วก็ส่งไปให้แอมนะครับซึ่ง In other news, the Philippine Coast Guard thanked the country's allies in expressing their support for the country's sovereignty at sea following run-ins with the Chinese Coast Guard and militia vessels during a seven-day patrol at the West Philippine Sea. Again, let's listen in. Ang sinisabi na atin na to my past attention sa West Philippine Sea, this is not something new. No, ito ay nangyayari na sa mga nakaraang taon. Eto ng pangharas ng China Coast Guard sa mga Philippine Coast Guard vessels at sa ating mga Filipino mainis na. The only reason na nalalaman natin ito sa publiko, it's because of the intention of the national government to be transparent as to what is happening in the South, in the West Philippine Sea. Etong pangyayari na to, this is just like a day-to-day routine na nangyayari sa Philippine Coast Guard. Philippine Coast Guard din po ay ikinatutuwa no na ang ginagawa nating pagpapatrol dito sa West Philippine Sea ay nakakapag nakakakuha ng suporta sa ating mga sa mga bansa katulad ng Estados Unidos at ng ng Australia para sa ipahayag nila ang kanilang uh, support sa Pilipinas. He also slammed Beijing's claim that the CCG's dangerous maneuvers near PCG vessels during the routine patrol were in response to provocative actions. I think it's also wrong to say that we provoked them. Um, as uh, you can see from the videos that um, we uh, publicized, no? that were also taken from our media friends. Ang uh, commanding officer ng barko, ng uh, barko natin doon, ang 4402 at 4403, ay uh, nagkaroon naman ng sumusunod sila no, sa alituntunin at sa regulasyon ng uh, collision prevention. Ang uh, China Coast Guard vessel na mas uh, di hamak na mas malaki sa Philippine Coast Guard vessel, ang nagkikerry out ng mga dangerous maneuver no, against sa uh, Philippine Coast Guard vessel. So... I think um, it is uh, not correct to say that we are the one who will provoke the China Coast Guard. It is actually their vessels who are provoking our vessels. In their latest monitoring, the PCG spotted over 100 Chinese maritime militia vessels lingering in the Julian Felipe Reef, plus two Chinese Coast Guard vessels in Ayungin Shoal. In our monitoring, sir, you know, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard vessels um, remain in um, Ayungin Shoal. Ito yung, uh, China Coast Guard 5201 and China Coast Guard 4202. Uh, with regard naman sa Chinese maritime militia that we were able to um, document last April 22, yung more than 100. Uh, the number is still remain. Uh, there is still more than 100 Chinese maritime militia in Julian Felipe. The second day of the official visit of President Marcos in the United States on Tuesday or Wednesday Philippine time has been very productive. After getting commitments from American global firms during eight back-to-back -back meetings in just half a day. As part of his official trip to the U.S., these meetings were held at the Blair House in Washington, D.C., where Marcus sat down and talked with various business leaders in a bid to entice more investments to the Philippines. Marcus, accompanied by the official Philippine delegation, started his business meeting around 1.45 p.m. with a group of prominent Filipino and American businessmen, the U.S. Philippine Society, co-chaired by former U.S. Ambassador John Negroponte, which made the commitment of greater cooperation Operation and partnership in the development of the Philippine economy. Also known as the Society, the USPS is a nonprofit binational organization of prominent civic and business leaders of the U.S. and the Philippines. Negra Ponte co chairs the Society with prominent Filipino businessman Manuel Pangilinan. The president also met with John Paget, 
president and CEO of Carnival Corp, who told the chief executive that his group of companies will hire around 75,000 Filipino seafarers in the next three to four years. Padgett, who also represents Carnival Cruise Line, Holland, American Airlines, and Seaborne, praised Filipino workers for their hospitality and competitiveness in the global workforce. In today's other news, a magnitude 5.8 earthquake jolted Isabella today according to the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology. The tectonic quake struck 15 kilometers northeast of the municipality of Makonakon at 8.49 a.m. It was 42 kilometers deep. Intensity 5 was felt in Peña Blanca, Enrile, and Tugigarao City in Cagayan. Intensity 4 was reported in City of Batak, while Intensity 2 was felt in Pasukin, Bacara, and City of Lawag, all in Ilocos Norte. Reported intensity is the traditional way of knowing the intensity based of reports of people who felt the earthquake while instrumental intensity is measured using an intensity meter that measures around or measures ground acceleration. Fivok said aftershocks are likely but damage is not expected from the quake. In today's other news, the Global Report on Food Crisis 2023 estimates that over a quarter of a billion people were acutely food insecure and required urgent food assistance in 58 food crisis countries and territories in 2022. This is the highest number in the seven-year history of the GRFC. Here's FAO's Chief Economist, Maximo Torero. Now... The population uh, are facing high levels of acute food insecurity, not only in magnitude, but also in prevalence. If we look at the 10 largest food crisis countries in terms of magnitude, the first one will be the DRC, the second one will be Ethiopia, then Afghanistan, Nigeria, Yemen, Myanmar, Syria Arab Republic, Sudan, Ukraine, and Pakistan. Now, what is the global overview in terms of displacement? 53.2 million were internally displaced in 25 food crisis countries, and 19.7 million were refugees and asylum seekers in 55 food crisis countries. The global overview on malnutrition shows that areas with high levels of acute food insecurity tend to have high levels of child wasting. Uh, if we look at the drivers, uh, the primary drivers of acute food insecurity in these countries were conflict, which was the main driver for people but economic shocks in this opportunity were the main drivers for more countries. And this is a consequence of what happened in, with COVID-19 and which was exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. And the global food prices decreased since March 2022, as FAO has reported, but we have not seen the transmission of that decrease into domestic food prices, which is still remain high. I will take you back to 2019, just before COVID, we had about 135 million people in 53 countries, which were in IPC3 or worse. Uh, today, 258 million people in IPC3 uh, in 58 countries. So it is very comparable. So you can just see that just from there, food insecurity has almost doubled. If you're a country, if you're a poor country, if you have high debt, if you have high food inflation, if you have high currency depreciation and if you are dealing with high interest rates and you happen to import your food, your fuel, or your fertilizer, you are in trouble. And you know, the unfortunate thing is that dozens of countries right now, they fit that criteria. Weather extremes and economic shocks have led to increasing acute food insecurity in countries such as Haiti, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe. And the number of countries where economic shocks were considered the main driver of food insecurity increased from 21 countries in 2021 to 27 countries in 2022. Weather extremes have become the main driver in 12 countries in 2022, up from 8 in 2021. The United Nations and ASEAN have a long-standing and mutually beneficial relationship. Let's find out more. The United Nations and ASEAN have a long-standing and mutually beneficial relationship, steadily progressing significantly over the last two decades. UN ties with ASEAN were formalized at the inaugural summit in 2000, further strengthened by the Joint Declaration on Comprehensive Partnership between ASEAN and the UN, 
adopted at the 4th ASEAN UN Summit in 2011. The Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific serves as the region's foremost economic and social development center. In this capacity, ESCAP bridges borders by providing an intergovernmental, multi-stakeholder platform for Southeast Asia to engage in regional policy discussions to tackle the challenges of transboundary and cross-border issues, amplifying individual country efforts through knowledge sharing and capacity building. The Complementaries Roadmap and the ASEAN UN Plan of Action serve as strategic frameworks which guide the ASEAN ESCAP cooperation in cross-sectoral areas, such as disaster risk reduction production, environment, energy, social development, and gender equality. To further strengthen this cooperation, ASEAN member states came together to endorse the second plan of action to implement the joint declaration on the comprehensive partnership between ASEAN and the United Nations. According to the Asia and the Pacific Sustainable Development Goals Progress Report, Southeast Asia is not on track to achieve the 17 SDGs by 2030. The sub-region is regressing notably on environmental and climate-related goals. In response, ESCAP has implemented technical assistance and capacity building to further amplify individual country efforts through rallying ASEAN member interaction on the energy transition, strengthening infrastructure and technological development towards an inclusive, resilient and sustainable future in the region. The COVID-19 pandemic and the triple crisis of food, fuel, finance have increased the level of development challenges in the region. ESCAP works directly with ASEAN members to highlight and address the needs the unprecedented event created. The partnership also addresses the need for resilience against future vulnerabilities the pandemic has exposed, including tackling rising levels of inequality, poverty, and the growing digital divide. This strategic partnership has also yielded invaluable insights into concerning inequality trends and have also worked together to produce comprehensive publications addressing these concerns. Examples of such vital issues includes, but we're not limited to, climate finance and investment opportunities related to supporting access to clean energy, food security, and digital transformations, which remain key catalysts for attaining the SDGs. Although the road ahead will present challenges, this integral and strategic regional partnership between ASEAN and ESCAP ensures that every nation in ASEAN has access to a support network that can provide strength and resilience towards a brighter future for all. In tonight's other news, Myanmar's junta pardoned more than 2,000 political prisoners to mark a Buddhist holiday there, triggering tearful reunions outside jails, but also demands that the many others behind bars be released as well. The military has arrested thousands of protesters and activists since its February 2021 putsch that ended Myanmar's brief democratic experiment and plunged the country into turmoil. Protesters and journalists were among the 2,150 53 people freed, according to an AFP reporter, a tiny fraction of those targeted in the military's brutal and sweeping crackdown on dissent. Those pardoned had been jailed under Section 505A of the Penal Code, which outlaws any action deemed to undermine the military. The law carries a maximum jail term of three years. On Wednesday, the military said it ordered the pardons for the peaceful mind of the people and on humanitarian grounds. Those who re offend will have to serve the remainder of their sentence with an additional penalty. More than 21,000 people have been arrested since the military ousted a civilian government led by Aung San Suu Kyi in 2021, according to a local monitoring group. More than 17,800 were still behind bars, according to the group's latest figures published on Tuesday. Suu Kyi is one of those in detention since the coup. At least 170 journalists have been arrested during that time, according to the UN. Myanmar ranked 173 out of 180 in the latest World Press Freedom Index by Reporters Without Borders. In its aim to help people around the world, the Iglesia Ni Cristo's Care for Humanity program conducted its blood donation activity in partnership with the Thai Red Cross. The event aims to help residents who need blood transfusion in hospitals and encourage blood donations in order to ensure the blood banks have enough supply of this life-saving blood. Don Lester Regalado is at the scene. 
Blood donors are lifesavers. Iglesia Ni Cristo members in Metro Bangkok are gathered here in the National Blood Center Thai Red Cross Society for a blood donation drive in cooperation with Felix Y. Manalo Foundation. Participants arrived early in the venue with the hope of saving lives by donating blood. Brother Manuelito Bondoc, Minister of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, led the said activity. The objective of this kind of activity is launched by the church administration is to show that the members of the Church of Christ are always united in obeying the commandments of our Lord God. One of these is to help our fellow men. Through this activity, we can show our love, our care to our fellow men, members of the Church of Christ or not, especially those people who are sick and immediately needs blood. To our Executive Minister, Brother Eduardo Vimanalo, Thank you for all the activities that you are launching for us to show our obedience to our Lord God. We, brethren here in District of Thailand, promise that we will always be united and actively participate to all the activities inside the Church of Christ. We love you po. This social civic activity shows how members of Iglesia Ni Cristo here in Thailand care for humanity. They are enthusiastic to do good to those who are in need. Reporting from Bangkok, Thailand, I am Don Lester Regalado, and we live in extraordinary times. Sports Day is but one of the whole family can join in, a perfect way to spend quality time together making memories as a family while enjoying some friendly competition. And the Iglesia Ni Cristo recently held a family sports day in Hanoi, Vietnam. Our ASEAN correspondent Ria Ramos reports from Hanoi. Let the fun begin! Members of Iglesia Ni Cristo here in Hanoi and Hai Phong, Vietnam are gathered for their very first Family Sports Day here in Vietnam National University of Agriculture Gymnasium. Four teams show their strength and agility in different sports such as basketball, volleyball, table tennis, badminton, and even in Laro ng Lahi. Brother Willen Regalado, the district minister, led the members in the said event. I'd like to thank Brother Eduardo Vimanalo, our beloved executive minister for giving us the approval to conduct this kind of activity for the sake of the brethren and we will continue to unite with you Paul in all your campaigns in all the holy undertakings so all of us be able to assure of receiving the promised salvation the event was also joined by members from Haiphong a city that's two hours away from Hanoi. Excitement to participate in this special event that is approved by the church administration is what motivates us to join this activity. Above all the friendly competition, smiles and laughter are shared by friends and families, easing homesickness and strengthening camaraderie. What we all loved and learned in this activity was this has not only enhanced our physicality, but this also strengthened the camaraderie of the brethren in the Church of Christ. The excitement and strong band is indeed manifested in this family sports day. Minds and bodies are not only strengthened, but most importantly, their love and faith. Reporting from Hanoi, Vietnam, I am Ria Ramos. We live in extraordinary times. And Southeast Asian athletes will vie for dominance in more than 30 sports in Phnom Penh from May 5 to 17 in everything from athletics and football to jet ski and obstacle race. The SEA Games has a flexible program which includes sports in the host favor and also allows for regional and newer disciplines. Here's a look at the four unusual sports at these games. Take a look. Believed to date back more than 1,000 years to the armies of the Khmer Empire, which spread across much of Southeast Asia, Khun Bokator is perhaps the most quintessentially Cambodian martial art. The graceful style incorporating elbow blows, shin strikes, locks and grapples makes its SEA Games debut just a year after being inscribed on UNESCO's list of intangible 
cultural heritage of humanity and so find itself in rude health only decades after nearly being erased. Cambodia will have an obvious advantage in Kun Bokator, but among foreigners looking to beat their hosts at their own game is Philippine MMA star Mark Strigel. In contrast to the ancient locally rooted Kun Bokator, Tekbol was invented as recently as 2012 in Hungary. Played on a specially curved table, it's a smash-up of football and table tennis requiring agility, stamina, and acrobatic overhead kicks. Top international football teams, including Spain and Portugal, bond over games of tech ball during downtime at training. And legends such as Ronaldinho have become ambassadors for the game. The stick-wielding martial art of the Philippines is back again in 2023, having only made appearances in 2005 and 2019 when the country hosted the Games. In Arnes, two players in body armor and helmets tried to hit each other with a baton made of rattan. In the uh, annual discipline, individual performers don traditional dress for choreographed routines with weapons. Arnes and Kun Bokator are the only national martial arts on display this month. Myanmar Shin Lon is especially a footballer's game of kippy uppy, but played with a woven cane ball by teams with deft touch, ballet or ballet, <laughs> balletic grace and physical invention. Hugely popular in the villages of Myanmar, it's a game of team cooperation. Six players keep the ball off the ground using any part of their body except their hands, with players performing flips as they kick the ball high into the air. In each match, two teams perform 10-minute sets, which are scored individually. First to win two sets takes the match. As my usual habit, I'd like to end the day on a positive note. Let's encourage and build each other up so that no one is left behind. And that's it for tonight's broadcast. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay in the news because we live in extraordinary times. Good night.